Hi, I'm Pastor Kenley Mann, privileged to serve as a chaplain for the Lutheran Home Association, uh, serving at Wellhaven Senior Living in River Falls, Wisconsin, and at St. Michael's Assisted Living in Fountain City, Wisconsin. A woman by the name of Marilyn Voss Savant is reported to have the highest IQ ever recorded in the Guinness Book World of uh, Guinness Book of Records. Her IQ was recorded at 228. Anything above 160 is considered to be genius level. This developed to Marilyn getting a column in the parade section that is in most Sunday editions of the newspaper. Uh, people, since she was so smart, would naturally want to ask her questions and uh, she would give uh, the answers in this column. And one time a questioner asked the age old question, what is the purpose of life? And he included his own opinion that the purpose of life is for a person to pursue his or her own happiness. Marilyn turned the question around and responded that if there is an intelligent creator behind our universe and a plan behind that creation, then our purpose is very, very simple. Our purpose is to serve our creator. If however, there is no intelligent design behind our universe, then we really have no purpose at all. For us believers, the answer is easy. We know that there is a creator behind our universe and that there is a plan behind his creation. And so our purpose is very, very simple and clear. Our purpose is to serve our creator. And the very best way to carry out our purpose is to love. And in a famous chapter of the Bible, the Apostle Paul tells us why love is the most excellent way. It is part of living the revolution. It means we are living with a purpose, and that is living a life of love. And as we live a life of love, first of all, Paul tells us that we can love because God loves us. I will read verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 13. And I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. I could be the most dynamic preacher since Jesus, Jesus Christ walked this earth. And if I don't have love, this is all that I would be. Nothing but a, a bunch of noise. Without love, that preaching wouldn't amount to anything. And what we need to remember is that we cannot love without God's love first. Picture yourself as being a cup that, that's, uh, that's empty. That's us by our sinful nature. We don't have selfless love in our hearts. We're, we're born self-centered, selfish. And then here I have a, a pitcher of, of water. Uh, this, this is uh, God's love. The water is God's love. And when we hear his word, when he, when he comes to us uh, through baptism and through his word and the Lord's Supper, what's he, what he's doing is he's pouring his love into our empty hearts so that now we can pour this water out to other people. We can give love to other people. <clears throat> Let me share a story with you. The Rosenberg, the Solomon Rosenberg family, went through the living hell that is a Nazi concentration camp in World War II. And Solomon figured his aged parents would be the first to go, and he was right. They were in their 80s. They were exterminated because they couldn't work and were of no value to the Nazis. Then Solomon feared that his youngest son would be next because David was crippled and again he would be of no use to the Nazis because he couldn't work. Every evening, Rosenberg came back into the barracks after a hard day of, of labor and searched for the faces of his family. When he found them, they would huddle together, embrace one another, and thank God for another day of life. But one day he came back into the barracks, and his worst fears became a reality. 
His oldest son, Jacob, was sitting on a barracks bed. He was crying. And he said, they took David. And then Solomon asked, what about mother? Where's mother? Mother can work. Where is she? And again, between tears, Jacob explained to his father that when the guards came, David was crying and he was afraid. And so his mother begged those German guards to let her go with him. And they did. She went with her son David to the gas chamber because of love. She gave up her life so that her son could be comforted by not being alone. And that's what that was. Pure, plain, simple, beautiful, unconditional, sacrificial love. David didn't do anything to gain her love. She went to her death because of her love for David. Okay, what I want you to do is to multiply that love billions and billions and billions of times over. I want you to take that love and apply it to every person who has ever lived. Then make that love personal as it applies to you. What that mother did for her crippled son, David, Jesus did for you, for all of us crippled horribly by self-centered sin. What did Jesus do? He went to be crucified on the cross, to receive the wrath of God on his own head, to have it fully expended on him so that, that same wrath would never fall on our heads so that we would not think that God deals with us, not have to think that God deals with us anymore in terms of wrath because he's done with wrath for us because he poured all that wrath on his son so that we would be permanently comforted with his love. Pure, plain, simple, Beautiful, unconditional, sacrificial love. God doesn't love us because we are Christians and view devotions. God loves us because he is love. And because he is love, because he pours himself into us as we hear his word, we, we now can love others. And Paul continues, he talks about how to love others. He gives us the do's and don'ts of of Christian love in verses four through seven. Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Two aspects of love's do's and don'ts stand out here. Love is not self-seeking, Paul writes. That means it puts other people first. Tim Hansel in his book called Holy Sweat tells a story about a guest preacher at a pretty large church in a city. He gets up and he starts his sermon and he says, my sermon this morning has three points. My first point is this. There are close to one billion people in the world starving to death. Most people yawn because they had heard it all before. He continued, my second point is this, most of you could really care less. And he added a bad word. Then he paused and continued, my third point is this. Most of you are more upset with me that I said that you didn't care and then used a bad word than you are over the fact that there are almost over a billion people in the world starving to death. That preacher's point is real. Love is a call to action, not pious platitudes, not lovey-dovey words like you find in a Hallmark card on Valentine's Day. Love is real. Love acts. Love is changing a dirty diaper. Love is putting a meal on the supper table when the kids have really not done much to help. Love is taking time to be a friend to a person who really needs your friendship. Love is a host of all kinds of other actions that require your time and your effort and your action and your attention. But I say the word require in a different way than what you might expect. Faith is a living thing in our hearts. An apple tree we could say is required to bear apples, but not because it's forced to, threatened to uh, do it, but because that's just the nature of an apple tree. It bears apples. When God poured his spirit into us, it's like he poured the sap of the Holy Spirit into us Christian trees, and we can't help it. Uh, we must. It's required that we bear fruit because that's 
the real us now. It's the nature of genuine faith. We, we love with the love that God pours into us. Or you could say we love with Christ who pours himself into us. Then Paul says, love keeps no record of wrong. When football teams play in the Super Bowl, you'll probably notice that they do keep score. The winners will be remembered and the losers will quickly be forgotten. It doesn't work that way with Christian love. Christian love refuses to keep score. Genuine love looks at all people equally, no matter who they are, no matter what they do, and especially no matter what they do to you. The only way that that's happening in our lives is if we keep our eyes focused on the cross. Seeing Jesus having the Father visit the score on, on him. Jesus was scored with our sins. So that Jesus' first words would be, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. And as we hear his word, he pours his spirit, that spirit of love, into us so that love keeps no record of wrong. Paul concludes this chapter with another reason why love is the greatest. It's verse 13 of 1 Corinthians 13. I'll read it. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Since the Bible tells us God is love and that Jesus is God, Every time you see the word love in 1 Corinthians 13, you could substitute the name Jesus. And in closing, let us do that with this, with this verse. And now these three remain faith, hope, and Jesus. But the greatest of these is Jesus. And that is our purpose. The revolution that Jesus has worked in us leads us to love, to give Jesus, who has given himself to us, who has given love to us. So we give it, so we give him to others. Amen. We pray, dear Lord, keep us from the arrogance of thinking that we don't need to hear your word. When we stop hearing your word, when there's long distances between us and your, hearing your word, we are arrogant, thinking that we can gin up love ourselves, but we grow dry. Keep us drinking from your word so that you can keep giving us your love, so that we can give your love to the ones we love and to the ones who hurt us, because you have loved us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.